Welcome to the Wicked Podcast, where we read the business books you don't have the time for. I'm Marcus Kirsch. And I'm Troy Norcross. And we are your co-hosts for the Wicked Podcast. Well, Marcus, I have to say this, and I actually genuinely mean this. This, what you and I are doing, it's not a workplace. But I must say that I feel like we've got good communication. I feel like I'm in a supportive environment. The demands are known very, very clearly. I have a moderate level of control over them. And so it's actually quite good to be working on you with you on, I don't know what, 80 something, 90 something episodes of, of the Wicked podcast. Yeah, we're getting really close to 80. And I think, yeah, I've, I think I've never, I remember because we had so many times where during a week we had two or even three episodes and we had good com communication about it, essentially going like, yeah, but we should be doing that anyways. Because it will give us some lead way into a couple of weeks and then we can chill out for a week or two, which we then never do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, at least we talk about it, right? We, we do. <laughs> we talk about it. But instead of us talking about it, who are we talking to today? So today we talked to Jill Hassan um, and her book, uh, Mental Health and Wellbeing at the Workplace. Surprise, surprise. Get the intro, <laughs> right? Yeah, you get it. So, and we had uh, a really lovely talk to her about exactly that. It's in the title. What were your takeaways? Um, I had two individual takeaways that, you know, in the book, she talks about the power of no. And I told her my favorite quote was, if you never say no, your yes doesn't mean as much. And she brought up the, the counterpoint to that. It's, it's not just about saying no when someone puts an unreasonable level of demand or expectation on you. It's coming back with the other half of that, which is the no and here's what we can do, or, and if you want that, here's what's required. And I think it's, it's getting that right balance of no and that's really, really important. Um, the other thing was we've got multiple generations with multiple experiences throughout life, all kind of feeling stressed, but not about the same things. And how do you create an environment in the workplace where different people and groups can kind of work together? And she you know, focused quite rightly on empathy. Maybe you don't have a direct one-to-one -one correlation and understanding, but you can empathize with the underlying feeling and emotion. And having everybody take the time to look for that common ground is really, really important. So a couple of really nice takeaways for me. What about you? Yeah, I think um, just like the whole design thing and the benefits of, you know, being customer focused and a lot of companies not getting it, empathy and mental, you know, health, well-being. It's another thing where it seems to be hard to convince often organizations about it. And it's really surprising that it's so hard to convince organizations about the benefits of it because benefits are very clear. And she talked about it. So one of the examples she gave us was a school that was in a state where 20% of the staff was sort of just about still happy at work. So 80% were pretty unhappy. People were trying to leave. The kids at school were suffering. Performance was down. Problems all over the place. And six months later, after actually changing that and addressing it through looking at how people were feeling and how happy they were and that, uh, the numbers were up to 95% of people being, being very energized at work, being very happy, feeling positive about it, and performance went skyrocket. And I'll, I'll, I, I see the same at you know companies, often in projects, if not one of them I'm involved now, where... Even simple things like clarity and additional time pressure and not communicating with the teams and the people that work for you about what's expected, what they can do for you, what you can do with them, you know, and just, just, just that already kind of not caring about the people who work for you to the point where you don't care about what stress levels they have and so on and so on leads then to obviously people are leaving, people are taking time out and give, don't even give you their real reasons anymore because they don't care, productivity going down. So, you know, and those numbers are big. Those numbers mean money, and they're going to mm. set you up for a really real struggle, not just to, for your existing people to perform, but, you know, any person who you ever want to hire. They're not going to want to work for you. And I've now been talking to a couple of clients over the last year, more than ever, who are struggling to hire people. Why? Mm. People don't think it's the right workplace, and people care more about that. And she also told the story of, I think, her sister or her cousin who was like, you know, I just don't care. And I think in interviews it comes through so people don't hire me, but I don't care. And they don't get 
someone to hire. So everybody loses in this. Mm. And it's, it's, it's big numbers. And I think to some extent we hear a little bit about it. But yeah, a lot of people seem to not wanting to go back to work. And I bet you it has a lot to do with this big wave of struggling around your mental health. And it comes out as a symptom in people just not caring anymore about even going to work, which is pretty substantial. And everyone's suffering. So and that they was are, a big one to me. They are suffering. And she pointed out a number of organizations, and we'll put all of these in the footnotes uh, for the show notes, that are here in the UK that help both employees and employers to manage and, and maintain and improve overall mental health in the workplace. But rather than you and I talking about it, let's go talk to Joe. Before the interview, a quick word from our very first sponsor, Sandcaster. We use Sandcaster for all our audio and video recording, and it's a very nifty tool that splits up all the channels for very easy editing. Sandcaster is used by 10% of all active podcasts. You can get 40% off the first three months and unlimited audio and video recordings with our special coupon code, Wicked Podcast. I repeat, I repeat, I repeat, Wicked Podcast for 40% off. And now the interview. Hello, everyone. Today we're here with Jill Hassan. Hello, Jill. Welcome to the show and thank you for being with us. Thank you for inviting me. And as usual, we're going to start at the top. So please tell our listeners who you are and why you wrote the book. Okay, so my name is Jill Hassan. Uh, I've written several books around subjects to do with emotional intelligence, mindfulness, communication skills, productivity, those sort of areas. So this was something I was very interested in, mental health and well-being at work, particularly because I also work in adult education and teach courses for people recovering from mental health problems. And so many people, it, I, I've been so surprised at just how many people have been triggered um, into suffering and, and, and uh, struggling with their mental health as a result of things that were going on at work for them. So, uh, and, and not just the people that I've had on courses, friends, family members, I just realised just how important we spend a long time at work you know we're, we're there five days a week generally most of us eight hours a day and uh, it, it's in, an important environment that we're happy there of course we don't need to be skipping into work every morning um singing and smiling but we do need to feel happy and i recognize that it's not just the employer's uh, responsibility to help people to have good well-being and mental health it's also the employees themselves so together with Donna Butler who has actually been a friend we've been friends for years Donna's a psychotherapist and she works at a national health trust here in Brighton supporting staff at work who obviously have you know, under a huge amount of pressure, medical staff all the time. So she was interested in joining with me to write a book that would explore how to how people can manage their well-being and mental health at work and how employers can support that. Mm -hmm. And to, to maybe go into a little bit of a definition or scope, um, because there's there's about five or six principles or different areas and, and things, attributes you describe, which I think work really great on sort of defining a bit of, you know, what, what, what are sort of a tick box of what you should be doing. And so can, can you elaborate a little bit on that, sort of what those key elements are on, on, on that, please? Yeah, actually, they were identified by uh, the UK's health and safety executive. They're the agency responsible for the research, advice, regulation and enforcement of workplace health safety and welfare and and they've generally uh sort of focused on physical safety and conditions but of course increasingly it's been recognized that uh people's emotional and mental um health needs to be looked at so they established a set of what they called management standards so these these six standards are concerned with what could be considered reasonable requirements uh in a person's job 
So first of all, there's the demands. Are, are the demands of their jobs, like their workloads, work patterns and the work environment, you know, looking at, at those, are they reasonable? Uh, second one is control. Are people able to have much of a say about how, when they do their work? A third one is looking at support. Do people receive adequate information and support? Do they have adequate resources provided by their employers and their their managers and their colleagues? A fourth area to look at is relationships, positive working relationships. Unfortunately, we hear a lot more really about bullying that's going on at work so that can really impact on people's well-being and mental health so there has to be positive supportive working relationships for people at work not just amongst colleagues but with your manager as well and then do people understand the role of their job and the responsibilities are are, are they asked to um, go above and beyond their role and their responsibilities are they given responsibilities that um, actually they're finding too difficult and then a final area to look at is how change is managed at work and I know this there's lots of business management books and and courses on this but it's really important we're we're all the same if there's change in you know we're creatures of habit and routine so when there's changes as human beings we often feel threatened so employees need to be consulted and informed about the changes at work so if these six standards are effectively managed employees it's felt will experience a good level of health and well-being at work but on the other hand mismanagement of any of these six key areas of a person's job can lead to stress poor health low productivity and increased accident and sickness rates at work so interesting that we're kind of talking about what the employer can do and the impacts of good mental health of employees I can be a real kind of almost anti-capitalist at times because I know so many decisions are driven by spreadsheets. You know, exactly what are the numbers? Show me the tangible numbers. Show me the numbers. And what I'm curious about is how can we take good mental health and well-being of employees and make it into a tangible business benefit that we can say it's worth investing in up front as opposed to saying we let it deteriorate and the project crashed and having perfect kind of 2020 rear vision. Yeah, well, absolutely. The, the, uh, every employer depends on having healthy and productive employees, employees that feel valued and supported. So they're far more likely to deliver the best outcomes for a business. All sorts of research shows this. It's not good business sense for employers to ignore the well-being and mental health of their staff. L- low levels of well-being and mental health result in poor performance and productivity. So workplaces that genuinely promote and value well-being and good mental health and support people are likely to reduce absenteeism and improve employee engagement and retention so it 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 makes business good business sense and I think that the thing that is important as far as I'm concerned is that you just have to look for and in the book we did look for uh, cases of good practice where organizations have taken into account their that they've prioritized their employees well-being and mental health and you can see that the productivity doesn't suffer it, it, it's it really is that simple I, I feel like that about any business you know look, whatever you're trying to achieve look for examples of good practice how have they done it do the same but most importantly having said that it starts at the top. It, it, it really does. Employees need to know that senior leaders and management at all levels believe that the well-being of staff really does matter. And they have to be seen to commit to providing the resources and, and doing whatever's necessary. It starts then if the uh, senior leaders are engaged with and, and, and genuine about supporting well-being. Uh, they have to take stock. They first of all have to find out, well, how is it for everyone? 
you know, are people feeling stressed? What what might be affecting people? What approaches and strategies maybe are already in place to support well-being and mental health at work? And how effective are those approaches and strategies? Once mm. you've got that information, you can then start addressing okay, what can we do to um, improve things? Because, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's just about being a... It's ethical to want the best for other people, but it's good business sense. Maybe yeah. that's the question. If you're not leadership, can you push it? Um, if you're leadership, uh, what's the first step you do when everyone says we don't have budget for anything? Okay, so I think that... Um, to put it bluntly, it's because people are ignorant. They they actually don't know what's possible and what's out there. So that 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 sounds quite harsh, but to put it nicely, is that people just don't know. Management, business owners, they 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 don't know. So so when you're scared, when you're as as you said, you know, revenues have gone down as a result of COVID and the pandemic and. Uh, you know, furlough, all, all sorts of things have, have impacted on businesses' revenue and profit. So, yeah, people people are scared, and that's fair enough. So when people are scared, they tend to just cling to what they already know and keep a, a very narrow focus and just want to plough on. And it so it takes quite a – it's quite a courageous step, and you have to be quite brave to go, okay – the world's changed. Everything's changed. We still want to continue in our business. We want to continue our organisation. We're going to have to change. What can we do? So that that's what I mean about the sort of the, the ignorance, the not knowing. Very often people don't know, so they don't make the effort to find out. And actually, there's a huge amount of support out there for organisations it starts at the top, yes. So let's look at whether you know what happens for senior managers and, and 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 business owners, and what happens if they're not engaged. What could you, as an employee or middle management, do about that? Well, it's at the top. You there, there's plenty of yeah re, stuff out there that that can help you. So for example, here in the UK, we've got Mind, the mental health charity. We've got. ACAS, which is an organization that supports businesses and their employees. We have something called Time to Change. That's a, an organization that uh, supports companies to support the well-being and mental health of staff. So there's all sorts of private organ training organizations. So you've got to do your research. You've got to find out what's out there. You look for training in other areas of your business to help improve productivity. So this is just another thing that you're doing. You're looking for, well, what training and support is out there? There's some fantastic stuff out there. So senior leaders have to actually do their research and find out what's out there or, or um, you know, get someone who works for them to do that research, whether that's the HR department or, or whoever it is. And then if you're at work yourself and you feel that, uh, that your management need to get some sort of understanding of the importance of supporting mental health and well-being at work, then again, do the research, take, take it on yourself. This is what I, I meant right at the beginning of, of it's not just the employer, it's down to you as an employee to look after your own well-being and mental health. So you can go and find out what's out there, what support is out there, and then take that maybe with the support of your colleagues to HR, to senior management, who, whoever would be appropriate, um, and 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 say that this is this is what you're interested in, and this is what you want to find out about. And you can also, even these organisations like Mind or ACAS or Time to Change, will actually help you put a case together to um try try to persuade senior management to take this on so it's out there it's just you know that's what we've got google for to find out everything and anything and you really can okay but i want to go to what i think is the step before that yeah 
I want to go to the step that will drive the actual change that will get people to go and start looking for resources. And I'm going to go and pull a section out of your book, yeah. The Power of No. Now, one of my favorite quotes is, if you never say no, your yes doesn't mean as much. Yeah. And yeah. I think it's really, really important to be able to say, no, this project is too much. No, this change is too much as an employee. And beyond that, I think it's important for leaders to be able to say no on behalf of their teams. No, yep. that target is not acceptable. And yep. by creating that friction, I think it then has other people to say, wait, wait a minute. They didn't just say yes. Why are you saying no? And it begins a dialogue. Can you talk yeah. a little bit more about the power of no and, and am, am I going in the right direction? Yeah, yeah, I, I, absolutely. Thank you. That, that, that's, that's so important. So it's the, the bottom line with, with the power of no, it, it, it relates to being assertive. Um, assertive is being very clear and honest and direct and straightforward about what you do want and what you don't want. So imagining a scenario where a project is unrealistic, the deadlines are unrealistic, it's, it's, it's just not working, people are starting to realise that. The thing about saying no is not only do you say, no, this, this just is unattainable, it's unrealistic, we can't do this, we're all buckling under the pressure, we don't have the resources, whatever it is. So you identify what and why it's not working. But in order to show goodwill and really get, as you say, a conversation going, is you it, the onus is then on you to suggest a plan B. I, that is so powerful. Rather than go, well, I'm just not. We're just not doing it, and that's the end of it. Which just is sort of it's defensive, it's confrontational, it doesn't invite conversation. But what it can be is we can't do this. This isn't possible. This is unrealistic. However, we've all talked about it. And these are the some of the ways forward that we can see we can go. So these are our limits. This, however, is what we think is possible. How about we talk about that? That's a far more constructive way to go forward. So, and maybe aligned to that. So if I remember, or, you know, I don't remember it like I have those conversations very often at least once in a project when I look at service design and design design thinking and you know customer first those kind of notions that are often very new to companies and they're actually quite equally true for customers as much as mm -hmm. your internal staff when you change a process and asking them questions consider them it's just often where the company as well goes like, but why should we do that? Just because it's nice, just because it's, you say it's good, right? So, um, you know, how, how big is the benefit, right? And um, do we know how big the benefit is? Because, you know, in design thinking, so it's design, you have these things where you can de develop something quicker to the market, you can de-risk what you do at different pace, gives you different options of pivoting and not over-investing and understanding problems better. And all of this helps to give you a competitive edge and save money and do more with the time and people you have. So there's, there's nearly a numbers proposition of, there of what that means. Um, is there something like that on, on the mental health side where you say, look, you know, the, the, the people who are only 40% engaged and people who might or might not want to work for your company, the reasons is you're not taking care of health care, so that of the health. The mental health and therefore you know 10 percent of your recruitment won't work or you know like will fail uh, and people will leave you in a higher rate and these kind of things are there are there any indications of on average sort of what sort of how big the problem often is or what the impacts might be yeah there, there's plenty of research that that shows that mental health at work is is, is one of the the, the key issues uh, uh, in the workplace now and that it's it's been shown in all sorts of, of, of ways that when people feel uh, what's known as psychologically unsafe, when they um, feel unstable, unsure, unsupported, or all of those sort of things, then they they 
they leave. They they either first of all buckle under the stress, and then they go off sick, which of course costs. Uh, an organization money when when there's absence uh it, it it costs in in all sorts of different ways other people have got to step up to cover their colleagues absence and then they're overworked and 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 so you know it, it it's almost sort of logical you, you you almost wouldn't need the research to show you this it's just you know let's just think this through if everybody's stressed what happens lots of them actually burn out they leave completely or they're they're under par they're not working properly then that impacts on the rest of the staff so it it just again just makes good business sense to take into consideration and support the well-being of, and mental health of, of staff and uh, again look for we've, we've got several in our book look for good uh, examples of, of good practice where organizations have been able to show that by supporting staff's mental health and well-being they've actually even imp- you know they've improved they haven't just kept things on an even keel they've improved productivity people are more likely to be inspired and come up with new ideas as well if, if you're an organization that requires new ideas as well as you know the actual hard work being done so i'm definitely always you know looking for examples of good practice because that's what's inspiring um i'm going to pick up on one thing that you said um a safe space uh in the book you talk about the stigma of mental health and the fact that some people are embarrassed to even talk about that and i think it's very important for employers to be able to do that but that's actually not the question that I, i want to get to i want to go to a slightly different question um i am officially a boomer I am an old white guy. I have been around the block kind of more than once. And I've dealt with stress for years, a variety of different types, both at work and in my personal life. Then you have new people that are coming into the workforce, younger generations who have little or no experience with stress. And maybe they find things that I don't find stressful at all, incredibly stressful. How can you create an environment where there's this kind of um, difference of opinion or different understandings of what is stress and create an open level of discussion to support each other? Yeah, yeah, that, that's really Im- important um, issue. So, so, so we're talking about empathy here. So empathy is not necessarily uh, recognizing um, uh someone else's situation is the same as yours but it's recognizing and relating to the emotion that they feel so so for example uh, you someone might tell you that they're really anxious about flying in an airplane they're very anxious about making a trip uh, if you were going to empathize with that if you if you yourself never had a fear of flying you might think well i can't empathize with that yes you can you can empathize with the feeling you've been anxious before maybe you get anxious about driving long distances on your own or going to a party where you don't know anyone so in terms of uh, the older working colleagues with the younger ones then yeah you've experienced stress they've experienced stress the fact that we each Uh, experience it over different things doesn't matter what's important is where our common ground is we both know what it's like to feel stressed now there's another part to your question that I've I've forgotten but I really wanted to answer what what was it Um, I'm I'm really not sure I, I started off by saying that I was a boomer but at the end I was trying to say younger generations and older generations create an environment for discussion to be able to support each other yeah yeah right great yes so what so there's something called um a uh mental health no what's it called oh god i've totally forgotten what it's called but there, there's um a well don't stress uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah it's a safe place think, there yeah i can't think straight i said it's I, i've got it it's a a wellness action plan mm. and it was something that was developed by an American woman whose name I've actually forgotten right at this, Mary Ellen, that was it, her name. Um, And it's something that's being used in all sorts of organisations now. 
in the UK, you can download from the website Mental Health uh, Charity Mind, you can download, download a wellness action plan template. And the important thing about these is that it's just quite simply that something, it's a document that gets you thinking and gets you to fill in what makes you stressed and anxious at work, what you might struggle with. So you 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 acknowledge, you identify and acknowledge what the difficulties are or could be for you at work. And then, so you might have to imagine some potential scenarios. You get those down and then you think about, okay, so what would support me in that? What, what, what would I need? What would I need to do for myself? You write that down. What would be helpful for my colleagues to do to help support me? And what would be helpful for my manager to know or to be able to do to support me? And then that's something that if that's, it, it, it can be shared, of course, but that it can be completely confidential. But if you've already started to uh, promote a culture of openness around well-being and mental health, it's more likely that people are going to feel more comfortable talking about it and, and actually getting some empathy and sympathy with each other, recognising that, OK, you get stressed and anxious about this. I don't, but I get stressed and anxious about that. Let's talk about it. So let's talk about how we both deal with that, because although your situation is different from mine, we might be able to give each other some ideas. So, But it does start with having a culture of openness around well-being and mental health in the beginning. So that could just be simply things like uh, putting up posters about well-being and mental health in your workplace, having information, ideas and advice about well-being and mental health in staff newsletters, staff magazines, inviting a speaker on mental health to an event uh, as part of, um, you know, training days. So it's encouraging and normalising open conversations about mental health and well-being can help staff to think more about how better to manage their own well-being and their ability to empathise and support others, to support their colleagues. That's a great, it's a great answer. Um, I hate to say this, but we've always got more questions than we have time. So I'm now going to challenge the two of you that Marcus doesn't give a five-minute rambling question and that we don't get a long, extended answer. Yours okay. is not rambling. Marcus always rambles. Yeah. Marcus, a, a quick, short question, please. So in short, and you preempted probably this question to some extent with your last answer, can you give us your best example of a case study where these things showed best practice in an organization? What's your best story of hope? Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's it's um, uh, uh, something that I came across uh, from, it was about four or five years ago, I think it was 2016, I read in a, an article uh, that a woman called Daniela Lang had written. She started as a head teacher um, at a school in North London and the school was failing. It, it, it wasn't doing well. The children weren't do, you know, succeeding as well as they could and staff morale was low. So she decided, Daniela decided to start a staff well-being team um, and asked for volunteers from the teaching staff to help. And she distributed a well-being survey. So, yeah, that, that was the, you know, seeing well, well, what what's going on. How are people really feeling? They asked questions and the results showed that only 42% of the staff felt that they got the support they needed for their job and less than half felt supported by their manager and 20% of the staff didn't even feel inspired to do their job, which... You know, they're teaching children. You, you'd you really hope that the teachers would be inspired because we want them to inspire our kids. So they had to deal with um, issues around fairness as well um, and consistency in the school amongst staff in terms of staff hours and overtime. So, so these things came up um, and they were addressed. Problems associated with workload. Uh, were particularly on an admin level were helped by by getting actually more resources more photocopiers employing an intern to help setting aside paid time to prepare resources 
um, th this well-being team was, was kept as a permanent thing. There was an open door policy for so staff were encouraged to approach of the team with any issues. Staff training was prioritised and it turned out the results, Danielle reported, were extraordinary. After two years, staff felt that they were, they reported, they did another survey and staff were much happier. Um, it Well, no, sorry, six months after the first survey, they did it again. So in such a short time, that, that's a really important thing. It doesn't take long to change things. So by then, 96% of the school staff felt inspired to do their job. There was only 20% six months earlier. 96% wow. felt supported by their line managers. And 100% of staff said that they felt really supported by their colleagues. There was much less stress. Staff felt supported and really did want to see the school go from strength to strength. So, yeah, there were some real tangible benefits there. It's exciting, not least because it was taking part in a school. Wonderful. And I think that's that those are the kind of numbers we need. Those are the kind of stories we need more. And um, so mm -hmm. I'll, I'll say at this point, thank you, Jill, so much for your insights, for your answers and for your stories. And thank you for being with us today. Thank you. You've been listening to The Wicked Podcast with co-host Marcus Kirsch and me, Troy Norcross. Please subscribe on Podomatic, iTunes or Spotify. You can find all relevant links in the show notes. Please tell us your thoughts in the comment section and let us know about any books for future episodes. You can also get in touch with us directly on Twitter on at Wicked and Beyond or at Troy underscore Norcross. Also, learn more about the Wicked Company book and the Wicked Company project at wickedcompany.com.